This is a man whose name sends a chill down the spine of terrorists. He served as the 48th Commander of 15th Corps of Indian Army, served as the Director General Defence Intelligence Agency and Deputy Chief of Integrated Defence Staff Intelligence under the Chief of Defence Staff CDS. A well-decorated officer who has been honoured with PVSM, Uttam Yudh Seva Medal, YSM and VSM. A towering personality, literally. Yet a very humble, down-to-earth, friendly person and a family man. Really, really honoured to have you on our channel, sir. Thanks a lot for coming to our channel. And congratulations. Congratulations on your uh, book becoming the bestseller. Wo pre order pe aate hi, uh, wo bestseller ho thi. Yeah, thank so, you, Lavina. And uh, first of all, uh, good morning to all your viewers. And uh, thanks for, yeah, the book opened as a bestseller on the pre order stage only. Uh, thanks a lot. That's right. I mean, that's a kind of popularity you have, sir. So uh, I'll start with my experience, uh, the with my first interaction with you. And that was about some propaganda in 2019. So I knew you were uh, on social media. I had sent you a DM saying, sir, this is some sort of fake news. Could you please check? I, I had forwarded it, uh, assuming that you may react, you may not react. Within five minutes, you came back and you said, I'm getting this done. That surprised me. Indian Army had suddenly become so approachable in 2019. Sir, you were a great part of it. How did it happen? Uh, yeah, I remember that uh, interaction, the small interaction we had. Uh, I look at it a little differently, and that's how I approach it also. Uh, in today's world, where the world is connected, the distances have reduced, you can see a person growing from six months to 36 years without ever meeting him or her. And when you meet on the roadside, you will stay to recognize, okay, here is Lavina Kang. So, so that is the type of world we are living in. So it's it's sad that if we don't interact, we don't communicate, we don't approach each other in today's world. Yes, the defense forces have certain uh, restrictions on the use of social media, but my way of looking at it is different. See, when you approached me, I was the Chinar Corps commander, the 15 Corps commander. And uh, I put it this way, the organization had faith in me that I look after the line of control. I look after the operations across the line of control into Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. I am responsible enough to look after the counter-infiltration into Kashmir Valley. I am also responsible enough to carry out the counter-terrorist operations inside the Kashmir Valley. But somehow, someone sitting on some desk feels, I am not responsible enough to be on social media. Now, that is where I said, I challenge that sort of a thing. I came on the social media with my name on day one. And like you approached me, a lot of other people also approached me. So when I respond to them, they know it is a response from a responsible hand who will True. not be part of the fake news. And this can be quoted. So it's very important to communicate these days. Like you are in the journalism thing. The breaking news has to run with or without your inputs. So it's better to give inputs, maybe the initial stage inputs, the corroboration, the details can come in later. But if it runs without your inputs, it may be more harmful to you. This is how I look at today's uh, connected uh, world. So how did Pulwama change it all? Because it was Pulwama which brought Indian Army to the social media and how. So you were telling me about that conference of yours where you said something, you know. Yeah, what was that again? See, uh, Pulwama happened on the 14th of February, 2019, as we are all aware. I had taken over the command of uh, Chinar Corps on 10th February. So I was not even 100 hours into my command when uh, this uh, incident happened and we lost 40 of our CRPF brave hearts. And now the question was, like I was part of the security operators, I was part of the team security forces as 15 core commander or Chinar core commander. Now the question was not to look into the nitty gritties or the blame game as to who did it right, who didn't do it right, where the you know issue happened or how, how come it was allowed, that vehicle was allowed inside the convoy. 
So in that conference which you are referring to, my point was, it was a conference in that evening, that whatever has happened, the court of inquiries, the inquiries, the investigations will deal with it, and the truth will come out sooner or later. Immediately, we now got to hit back. And before I go further, when I was driving to that conference, my ADC, Captain Sandeep Singh, was with me. And of course, it was a very big incident. He was a young officer, was also anxious. So he asked me, sir, ab kya hoga? So pardon my language. I said, we'll get the bastards. And within 100 hours, we got the module which had carried out the Pulwama incident. And we eliminated that module, including the leader who was a Pakistani national called Kamran, the main terrorist, Ghazi, and the CIA, Kitne Ghazi guy, which incidentally is also the title of my book. Sir, you were not just countering them across the border, you were also countering the narrative warfare by ISI. The uh, Till then, Pakistan's ISI agency was all over churning the propaganda and Indian Army came back and started hitting them with, let's say, online missiles of truth and started exposing them. Sir, I would like to know how, how what was the strategy behind, because while Balakot, Pal uh, Pulwama happened, all this was also happening simultaneously. And you see, were also uh, heading to intelligence. Yes. Uh, see, all these things of uh, trolling, the social media, the narrative building, the fake propaganda, there is a massive machinery which gets involved in all these things. There is a full nation against us which is doing it. There is a full army, Pakistan an army which is involving itself in doing all these things. So we have to hit back. If you remember after Pulwama, the jesh -e muhammad was the terrorist organization which carried out that attack. And in short, they are called Jash. So all the Pakistani trolls, If you, there's a very famous Hindi movie in which there's a dialogue. How is the Josh? So they started trolling. How is the Jash? So we had to hit back and within 100 hours, of elimination by eliminating this module, the morale of the country came back to how is the Josh? True. So we carry out our operations in a very transparent manner. We do not indulge in fake propaganda. We counter their fake propaganda by facts and figures and our responsible and ethical army, which we are. We had their 93,000 prisoners for a number of years. Whether they played golf here, they had scotches here, they enjoyed themselves, I'm sure. All of them put on some weight by the time they went back. So we are an ethical country. We are a country with a history of 5,000 years. We have our value system. We have our transparency and operation. We carry out all our counter-terrorist operation in good faith with minimal force. We don't uh, fire from the attack captors and uh, heli bomb missiles as they are doing in their uh, western part of the country. So we, we, we do it differently and we do it ethically. That's right. So uh, now I'll come to the heavier subject, the Kashmir, because you have seen Kashmir through 30 years, through its thick and thin. Uh, if I am right, you were there in 88, 89 till 2020. So um, how, what was your first reaction when, you, when the exodus of uh, Kashmiri Pandits began? And I want to know uh, what, from your perspective, how was Kashmir through these 30 years, from 88 to 2020? See, when uh, I written about this in uh, great detail in my book, almost two chapters on this. Uh, when I went in September 1988, I was a young captain, part of my unit or battalion, posted in North Kashmir in Kupara district. So this feeling of animosity, the feeling of anti-India, the hatred against uh, no, other uh, Indians or non-Kashmiris was very much visible. This ko kehte na, hawa mein wo feeling thi. And this feeling of terror was prevailing at that time, even before 1990. There were killings happening. There were threats being given. There were boycotts of the elections happening where polling was as low as 5%. In Kashmir, uh, in the Srinagar constituency, no one contested a particular party. That 
contestant won unopposed in a parliamentary constituency. That was the type of threat and terror prevailing at that time. And there afterwards, the infamous date of 19th January 1990 is just a date. The terror and the feeling of terror was there prevalent much before that date also. And after the Kashmiri Pandits uh, were forced to leave the valley, I make it a point here to tell it's the Kashmiri society who lost because the Kashmiri Pandits were mainstay of education system in Kashmir. Once Kashmiri Pandits left, the education system crumbled. crumbled. And today, the boy of Kashmir who, because he could not get good education, and then came the Hartali door, the Hartals, the buns calls. Every second day was a Hartal in Kashmir or a bun. And as a result, the boy could not go to school. And in the end of the year, they will pass them all in bulk. Okay, you know, promoted to next class. But when he came to 11th class or 12th class, he had to compete against the rest for a seat in a professional college or a, some competitive exam to join some uh, administrative service. Because of his background and poor education, because of terrorism, he could not compete. And now he is a cannon fodder for terrorist organization to take him into their rank and file. So it was a very well thought about uh, sort of a thing by Pakistan to make sure the Kashmiri youth do not get good education, do not get good employment, and become part of their terrorist machinery. So Kashmiri society lost the Kashmiri mother, whose son joined terrorist organization and died in an encounter. She lost. The Kashmiri businessmen, businessmen lost, lost on the, uh, their business because tourists were not coming. The Kashmiri youth lost their livelihood and future of life. And all because Pakistan army and Pakistan were carrying out terrorist activities inside Kashmir at the cost of Kashmiri people, especially the Kashmiri youth and Kashmiri mother. Sir, and then when you came in, you started something like Operation Ma, and I heard you speak after Pulwama that the two guys who had carried out the attack, one of them was a technical guy, and the other who had hardly been there for one month, and the shell life of terrorists had in any case reduced, and Operation Ma was quite a success. Uh, people were able to call back their uh, children. Uh, so that was hats off, sir, hats off. I mean... 30 years, it took us 30 years, but so also there was a point which was pre-abrogation of 370 and then there was after 370. So one, how did the life of civilians change? How did the approach of army change? Army, as I said earlier, was operating always in a very transparent manner and wherever there was an abrasion, that yes, abrasion was immediately addressed, the inquiry done, the punishment meted out to the guilty, and that was the justice delivered. But that was far and few. Most of the cases, Indian Army did very, very transparent and ethical operations. The life, how it changed after abrogation of 370 was, like I'll give you small insight into Article 370 for the benefit of your viewers. So Article 370 was basically that provisions of Indian constitution will not be applicable to subjects of Jammu and Kashmir. This article was not religion specific. This article was for all the subjects of Jammu and Kashmir, irrespective of their religious belief. It was applicable to Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Jains, Buddhists, Christians, everyone who was residing in the Dijan state of Jammu and Kashmir. Article 370 was not a precondition for the Maharaja to sign the instrument of accession in October 1947. Neither it was part of it. As much so, it came into existence. So first time Article 370 was thought of was in October 19, uh, sorry, 49. So it was more, more or less two years after the accession instrument was signed, Article 370 even was thought of. Hence, it is illegal, it is uh, unwise to connect the Article 370 with the instrument of accession. Now, Article 370 meant Indian provisions are not applicable in Jammu and Kashmir. After independence, 106 amendments have happened to the Indian constitution for the betterment of the citizens of India, including some very prominent amendments like Right to Information Act, which empowers the citizen to question his or her government. 
Now that was not applicable in Jammu and Kashmir. Hence, the normal Kashmiri or normal uh, subject of JNK could not question or ask the government where the money is being spent. Hence, in the garb of protection from Article 370, the corruption was rampant. And nothing was happening on ground. Only few families were progressing. So this article had to go. Now, after 5th of August 2019, life has changed a lot. There is accountability. There is an anti-corruption bureau. Earlier, there was nothing called anti-corruption bureau. Now, whatever the money is being spent, the infrastructure development happening, some all women universities coming up, the airports being revamped, there is infrastructure development happening. So life of a normal Kashmiri or normal subject to Jammu and Kashmir is changing for good. And of course, there is a peace, much, much, comparatively much better peace now. True, sir. Sir, and uh, what is, uh, how is, you know, now that we've got into Kashmir, so there's one chapter in your book about Rashtriya Rifle. Sir, have you served in RR? Oh, great. Oh, number of, number of times and number of years. Oh, I, that's... I served in uh, Rashtriya Rifles as a major. Then while I was commanding, I was doing the job of Rashtriya Rifles. I commanded a Rashtriya Rifles sector as a brigadier. I commanded Chinar Corps, which had almost uh, 45, uh, 40, 45 watt battalions of Rashtra Rifles under my command and two Rashtra Rifle Forces, the Kilo Force and Vector Force under my command. So I know Rashtra Rifles inside out. That's great. Sir, Rashtra Rifles is what changed the scene in Kashmir when it comes to terrorism is what I heard. It's really great to know that you were part of it. Uh, sir, I was, I was part of it. When this scene was changing, I was posted in Lolab as a Rashtra Rifle Company Commander. And oh the, that name of the chapter is ARA, that stands for Rashtra Rifle. ARA, sirf naam hi kafi hai. And that's exactly how ARA is seen in Kashmir or Jammu and Kashmir. As also, this is how they changed the future of Jammu and Kashmir for good and for more peace and for betterment of citizens and subjects of Jammu and Kashmir. ARA, is a force which evolved from a riffraff force, as it was initially called, to the one of the world's finest counter-terrorist forces today. RR sirf naami kafi hai, sends the shiver down your spine. It's a wonderful operation mm -hmm. to serve in. True, sir. It's it's uh, whenever there is an operation and then suddenly the news comes, RR is here. Yes. Things are handled. Matlab, unka kaam khatam. <laughs> and, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Sir, and and, and, and let, me, let me tell you, RR is not only carrying out counter-terrorist operations. Since RR is deployed in the far-flung area of the valley, where otherwise the administration, the reach was not there because of uh, terrorist uh, environment, as also because of the infrastructure development not having taken place in the last 70 years in those areas. So RR was immediate neighbor. And there is another... Uh, initiative which started during my time and I coined the phrase hum saya hai hum. That means we are neighbors. So RR post in those wilderness or those remote areas was the only hope for the people of that area. Even in the middle of night, if a woman is having labor pains, they would walk up to the RR post which had medical help or for any other help. RR has been a great source of you know, support for the local population in the remote areas. So, hum saya hai hum is also a phrase which RR did it wonderfully. I must say this. I, I saw this video where it was snowing in the middle of the night. Uh, a, a team of RR officers, uh, there was RR officers, of course, the uh, soldiers. They were carrying the woman on their shoulders despite the heavy snow. And uh, they managed to get the ambulance. And of course, like they had to bring her out. Because the vehicle could not go, and yeah, it reminds me. I remember. Me of that. I remember that, uh, Levina. I remember that uh, incident. That happened on 14th of January 2020. Why the date is uh, still in my mind is because next day was the army day. 14th of January 2020. The lady's name was uh, Mrs. Shamima in the Baramula sector, and in the middle of the, it was snowing very heavily. In the middle of the night, there is another initi initiative called Carrier Patrol. Where is the normal surveillance patrol or uh, you know, area or domination patrol goes out? And they also act as a carrier patrol. They will go to a village, ask them if all is well. Carrier means you know, knowing about their well being. And ask them if everything is okay. They carry a medical uh, assistant with them or a medical doctor with them 
And there in that village, this Harriet Patrol came to know there is a lady who is in uh, labor pains and uh, she needs to be taken to the hospital. That leader immediately contacted his CEO. CEO contacted the uh, helicopter unit. I was the corps commander. We flew in a helicopter, but then because of the weather, the helicopter could not land. Then CEO sent 100 RR men along with 30 odd civilians to beat the route so that the ambulance could be taken. The ambulance was brought halfway through. From the other side, the lady was carried on the shoulders on a charpai by the Jawans and the locals, what you are referring to. And where the ambulance could reach, there the lady was transported into the ambulance and the boys pushed the ambulance in the snow and took it to Baramula, where she delivered a very healthy baby in a hospital in Baramula. And next day, on the 15th of January 2020, that is the Army Day, the Prime Minister of India, the Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, tweeted from his handle and gave a, a photograph of that evacuation. And this is also part of my book. I remember this incident very vividly. And this is a very great example of Ham Saya Hai Ham or Khariyat Patrol. And of course, she delivered a healthy baby operation. Ma is omnipresent. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. So this reminds me of an audience question that I got. And it was like Indian Army. Uh, the moment the, the audience heard that it's you who's coming to our channel. The first question that I got was, when is POK happening? When is POK happening? So what okay. will be your answer? Okay. Okay. This is a very commonly asked question. And uh, I would like to go into a little background of this. There is a resolution of Indian Parliament, both the houses, joint resolution, which says Pakistan occupied Kashmir is part of India. And it is because the day on 26th of October 1947, when Maharaja of JNK signed the instrument of accession to become part of India, the Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir, Gilgit, Baltistan, and other areas were part of the state of Jammu and Kashmir at that time. So, whole of Jammu and Kashmir as it existed on 26th of October 1947 is part of India, and we will take it at the right time. Since I know as 15th Corps Commander and also as an intelligence chief later, I know so many things, but I will not like to say more than this. Pakistan occupied Kashmir will be taken at the right time. That's, that, that, that line gives me goosebumps. <laughs> so, uh, so another thing that uh, uh, audience wanted to know is, Sir has always been mentioning Pakistan, but he never mentions China. So there was this audience who, uh, the, the, a member from the audience who asked, so I would like to know what is Sir's view on how China functions? See, again, uh, having been part of the intelligence uh, network and team, uh, one knows all great details about how China functions. Uh, but then these uh, issues are not for uh, public discussion or public discourse. But suffice it to say, China is a very close society. I'm saying society. And since the military comes from the society, it is. And China's military also is a very, very, you know, closed or very secretive uh, type of a military setup. And their political and military is intermingled. Yeah. So their uh, political masters and the military masters are the same. So there is a, uh, there is a lot on the net which you can read. So I leave it at that. Go and read that. Uh, but as a military man, as a strategist in the defense, I look at the China differently as compared to Pakistan. Pakistan's Punjabi Muslim mindset is different than the Chinese mindset. There is a there is a too much of a difference between the thinking, the way they operate, the way they do things on ground, and where they maintain their secrecies. The two different uh, ball games. Interesting. So uh, that was a very important thing that you said. So another thing is, right now we since last almost uh, ten months we've been seeing war in Russia Ukraine. So uh, not going into the details of um, so not going into the details of the war, but uh, sir, I would like to know. What are the lessons that Indian Army would learn from Russia-Ukraine uh, war? Okay, uh, 
the lesson which we learned from Russia Ukraine war also has a linkage to your previous question about China. And I did not touch about the technology aspects, and a lot of people talk about you know, advanced technologies, you are one of the experts uh, about uh, technical details. So I dare not uh, say more than that. And the point is, the technology is vis-a-vis the human soldier. The man sitting in a multi-story building with a sniper, vis-a-vis -vis all the technologies of space and what have you. There is a clash there. Now, a lot of things have come in the fore. Wherein this jo bhram, thana bhram, ki shared technologies win the wars. Those <laughs> myths have been shattered in Ukraine war, Russia Ukraine war. The built up areas always remain a tough nut to crack. That has also been proved. In, another thing which has been proved in uh, Russian Ukraine war is you cannot afford to fight wars at far flung uh, frontiers. You need to have your resources bang on and commanders on ground must know what to do and most important point about uh, ukraine russia war is you set out an aim in mind and when you go to war and you set out a uh, end state for yourself that is this is where i want to finish this war now that is the debate about russia ukraine war as to both the parties warring parties what were the aims when they went in and what were the end states they had set for themselves? So that's the subject of uh, research in totality. Coming down nearer home, it gives us great lessons at military level and at diplomatic level. I'll talk about the military levels first. Military levels is any amount of technology or technological difference. Does not make a difference when your Juan is sitting tight in a bunker in a high altitude picket. The picket has to be captured physically, and the soldiers who have lived their lives in the high altitudes, in the counter terrorist operation, who have withered the weather, are much better than the conscripts of two years, 17 years old boys who are going to be opposing you. So, that is one lesson which Indian Army, only the Indian Army has taken as to the hardened soldiers, the ground holding still continues to be the most important aspects when you're fighting in the Himalayas. Now, at the diplomatic level, the world is divided. One is Russian side, other is Ukrainian or American side. India is the only country, the fifth largest economy in the world, which is standing. Someone asked me this question uh, when the war started uh, sometime in the month of March. Where does India stand in this war? My reply was India stands on its two feet. <laughs> We stand our authority. We are not like they are poles in the world. I said, we are the pole. Now people will gravitate to us. And the number of diplomatic visits which have happened ever since this war started from both the camps is a testimony that India's foreign policy, that is, we will do whatever is in our national interest, has been the most successful without taking sides. And our, for, uh, our foreign minister, Dr. Jashankar, has always articulated it in the most perfect and hitting uh, way of uh, speaking. Our national interests are our prime interests, period. So that, these are the few lessons uh, from Ukraine, the Shavar. So there was another question from the audience, which I thought was really, really interesting because the question, the uh, thing was, ki Madam, sir, 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 Kitne Gazi I, Kitne Gazi Gai. <laughs> so I, 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 I did make sense in it. And I'm like, yes, I will definitely ask you, sir, tell me uh, how did it come about and really Kitne Gazi I, Kitne Gai. Okay, this uh, phrase Kitne Gazi I, Kitne Gazi Gai, this came about in a press conference on 19th of February. Immediately after we have eliminated the module which carried out the Palwama blast within 100 hours. And as I said earlier, the commander of that module was a Pakistani terrorist called Kamran, whose code word was Ghazi. Ghazi is a very preferred code word for Pakistani terrorists. And as uh, we discussed earlier, I have had number of tenures in Kashmir, where a lot of Pakistani terrorists with the code word Ghazi have been eliminated earlier. And this code word keeps coming back. 
So after the Pulwama blast, there was a lot of buzz in the media that the commander of the module which had carried out the blast was a, a terrorist by code word Ghazi. So once we declared that, okay, this is the module which has been eliminated, the terrorist killed, and we gave the name uh, Kamran. So a journalist asked me uh, towards that other conference, sir, has Ghazi been killed? So my reaction to that was, I said, Kitane Ghazi hai, Kitane Ghazi gai, hai, don't worry, we are there. It was basically because so many of Ghazi code words have been eliminated in the past. So Kitane Ghazi hai, Kitane Ghazi gai. I've written about in the book also, the complete sequence, there is a connect to my childhood also in this. So after this, the young company commander is in RR post. They started writing this uh, phrase on the gate of their company. Kitre gazi hai, kitre gazi hai. So it became a morale boosting uh, for the young soldiers. So it really worked. And uh, now it's, of course, part of the book also. It is the title of your book, sir. So I'm sure it uh, uh, that that was a very famous thing, and I'm hoping with this they will stop naming their terrorists as Gazi. They, they have. The By the way, they have uh, stopped naming uh, terrorists as Gazi now. The number of oh, terrorists or the percentage of Gazi convert has come down drastically. Now they <laughs> hardly have any Gazi coming in. So that's true. Good one, sir. Good one. Really good one, sir. Now I wanted to show you some pictures. I want to know what was your reaction and what was going on when those pictures were clicked. Uh, so I'm sharing the screen with you. Uh, yeah. This is a picture uh, when I was, I think, uh, this is a picture clicked in 1973 or 74. I was about oh. 12 years of age. And this was clicked by a cousin uncle of mine in Nepal. I was okay. in class eight. And uh, those days, uh, I didn't use to tie the turban. There used to be a hanky on my uh, hair knot. So yes. this is a picture clicked in uh, Nepal in 1974, I think. I was in eighth class. Oh, great memory. <laughs> no, sir, this one. What was oh, sir? This is a picture. Uh, this is uh, December 1986, Udaipur. Okay. And uh -huh. uh, I had completed uh, three years of service. Since after the field tenure, we had come to peace. In a peace uh -huh. station, uh, you become acting captain those days at the service of three years. So this is in the mess. Uh, Brigadier Mukherjee, then uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mukherjee was my CEO. And the Subi Sari, the twice, who are standing on either side of me. And there's a bowl uh, in which there is a punch of different drinks put since I was for four Ajri. So four large scotch whiskey drinks were put in that bowl. And your ranks are dipped in that punch. Then CO and 2IC take out the ranks and put it on your shoulder. That means I was a lieutenant. Now the captain's ranks are put on the shoulder. And then the officer who is promoted, in this case it was me, has to drink that bowl in one gulp. So this is a tradition. Uh, in army, it's called pipping. In navy, it's called uh, wetting the stripes. So this was my promotion from lieutenant to captain, December 1986, Udaipur. And again, there's a picture in my book also, where uh, when I was a CEO, a lieutenant was getting promoted to captain. His mother was there, okay. present uh, in the unit at that time. They were, the parents were visiting him. So we have a thing where CEO is putting the rank on the other one side. On the other side, the ranks are being put by the mother herself. What a proud mother she must have been. So that pic is there in my book. And oh, uh, that's thank good. you. I think again, a nostalgic <laughs> memory. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is uh, when you join NDA. Uh, I think it was 5th. I joined NDA on 4th of January 1980. I think this was taken on 5th of January 1980. And uh, when I joined NDA, this is not very clear here. The number, the NDA number 14156 is, uh, you know, uh, tagged onto your left chest. So this is the first picture which is taken in the academy, which uh, comes on your uh, identity card and other documents. And uh, the beauty about non-sick cadets is they come with all the flashy and long hairs. And in those days, Danny Danzogapal's <laughs> hairstyle was uh, very popular. So especially the Bhutanese cadets came with all the flowing hairs right up to the shoulder. And their pick, the non-sick cadets pick is taken after they've taken the zero cut haircut. So that pick when they the to their cut. parents, uh, yeah, zero cut and now uh, the crew cut. And when they send that pick to their parents, so the documents go to their parents for certain signatures and all, 
parents refuse to recognize the child. So these pictures of NDA, I put this in my book also. And even today, when I go to the NDA site and uh, search my name, the picture which appears along with all the details is the same picture. So this is <laughs> a historical picture for every ex NDA, because this remains with his biography, his uh, biodata in NDA till date, even after retirement. So once again, thank you for sharing. Uh, this picture was after 5th of August 2019. This was taken from the Chinar uh, headquarters of SESBES, where self and the army commander, General Ranbir Singh, were standing and looking at the Srinagar town. This was taken around, I think, 8th or 10th of August, where everyone in Kashmir, in India and in the world felt and some people even expressed their uh, opinion that Kashmir will burn after 5th of August 2019. That is the abrogation of Article 370. There will be bloodshed. There will be, you know, burning. There will be mutiny in certain forces. So after about five, seven days, nothing like that happened. And Lieutenant General Ranbir Singh, the Army Commander, Northern Command, and self, we are standing in the lawns of Chinar of Mass and looking at Kash Sirinagar town per se, and in the long distance, the Kashmir Valley, which was peaceful, quiet, and absolute tranquility was prevailing. So this picture was again taken by Captain Sandeep Singh, my ADC. And this picture <laughs> shows that we were softly or quietly telling ourselves things have gone the way we had expected them to go. Kashmir remained peaceful after abrogation of 370. So that gives me goosebumps, really. Oh, yeah. I did not really know that this is such a historic picture. Yeah. Uh, so there's another picture. This is the picture. Uh, 2004, 4 January, Suratgarh. Uh, this is when the brigade commander was inspecting the battalion which I was commanding. That is 15th Battalion, the Rajputana Rifles. And there is a ceremonial parade lined up. You can see the January mist in the deserts in the backdrop and in that mist somewhere the whole battalion is lined up for the drill to be inspected by the uh, reviewing officer that was the brigade commander in uh, that location so i was to lead that parade and i was waiting for the brigade commander to arrive the first thing when the reviewing officer arrives is you salute him with the rifle with the sword uh, and you give him the report of the battalion present for the inspection and parade so subsequent pictures of this are when I'm leading the parade and the reviewing officer is reviewing it. This was while waiting for the reviewing officer to inspect the parade. This is January uh, 2004, Suratgarh, Rajasthan. There's a reason why I uh, chose this picture. You were looking so steady and um, I, I, I really looked at it. If it is a, like, you know, wax statue or something, I mean, you, this is such a perfect picture. I, I decided I'll have to ask you about it. What is going on? So I'll move to the next. Uh... This was Infantry Day 2019. Uh, October uh, 2019. I was the Chinar Corps commander. And I was also the colonel of the regiment of the Rajputana Rifles. And okay. Jal Bipin Rawat was the chief of army staff. And then... It is at the National War Memorial at uh, India Gate uh, Complex. After laying the wreath for the fallen soldiers of infantry, the General Rawat was shaking hands with all the colonels of the regiment. And I being the colonel of the regiment is in that famous Rajputana rifle Safa, which was also visible in the last picture, which is the ceremonial headgear whenever you are on parade. So this is after laying the wreath at National War Memorial in October 2019, Infantry Day is the event and this is shaking hands with the D then chief late general Bipin Rawat. So uh, how was your equation with general Rawat? Because uh, well, you both yeah you again, both were written, uh, into the thick of everything chapter, together. Chapter, uh, written a chapter on general Bipin Rawat in my book and uh, the chapter heading is the man the soldier soldier and the man the famous George Bernard Shah the soldier, the man as I knew him. I have written about him as a soldier, that is as an officer. I have written about the man, that is as a human being. I have written about the, as a family man. A lot of oh. us don't know about 
he was a very wonderful father, wonderful husband, and a wonderful person in his social life. I have written in details. And uh, just now that since you asked, the day of his the accidents news poured in, that is 8th of December 2021, when I came to know somewhere around uh, 12, 31 or so, immediately with my wife, I went to his house. His daughter, younger daughter was alone at home because his elder daughter is married in uh, Bombay, Mumbai and uh, they were there. So me and my wife stayed with uh, his younger daughter till about 5.36 in the evening when other friends and the relatives started uh, coming in. And then we went to Brigadier Linder's and Kal Harjinder's uh, house to meet the ladies there. So I had a wonderful equation with him. He was a thorough gentleman, wonderful professional, still solid senior officer. And his rather sharp memory that, you know, I'm not able to speak much because of my feelings. The chapter in the book gives out a lot of small little anecdotes which shows the man's personality, which shows the officer's, you know, strength and his towering, towering personality as a senior officer. A wonderful human to work with. We lost a great visionary on 8th of December 2021. My salute to my general, my salute to my chief and the CDS. Uh, I, I can see you're already overwhelmed with emotion. I'll move to one more picture. Uh, this one is this one is uh, this one is a picture which of which I found a painting also, uh, and it surprised me how much it must have moved others. So um, this is a famous picture. Again, yes. what was happening? This was on 31st of January 2022. Hanging your spurs or hanging your boots is a phrase is a phrase which basically signifies that now you have had enough of battles, you have had enough of your uh, you know skirmishes. Now is the time to get back to the family, relax, do something which you have missed in those 40 years. So since I came back from the office and I was removing my boots. Incidentally, that day was a dress. The dress of the day was the terracots. That is the OG olive green, plain olive green uniform on 31st January 2022. But I preferred to wear the combat dress and the old mm -hmm. combat dress, not the new combat dress. So because I said I spent my lifetime in this combat dress, I must wear it on the last day in the office. So this, when I removed my boots, now, metaphorically, I hang them on a nail on the wall saying, here I hang my boots who have been with me through thick and thin, through day and night, through mud, snow, sun, rain, what have you. And these are actual boots which I've worn in a lot of operations since my youngster days. So this is a very touching picture again. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I can understand, sir. So, okay, this is one last picture. I'll not be troubling you too much. Uh, but this is a very fun picture of yours. I mean, I have seen you challenge uh, many youngsters in dance competition. I saw an Instagram video of yours where you, you were challenging youngsters. And then I saw this picture of yours. So, <laughs> your comments. I would love to know your comments on this one. This, this picture is... Uh... 1985, September or October. You were still and, a bachelor? Uh, this is, I was a bachelor. This was my <laughs> first bike. And uh, how I got this bike is also an anecdote which is narrated in the book. This was oh. a Royal Enfield or a Bullet. In uh, Punjab, they call it Bullet and not Bullet. So okay. this was the first bike in Udaipur, Rajasthan. I was a bachelor. And uh, if you see in this picture, the rear pocket of my trousers is a little swollen. So I was going to buy, there's a full uh, money in the purpose. Okay. And I was buying, going to buy the first color television for myself as a bachelor. And that first color television uh, was the first color television in my entire unit. So after yeah, yeah, I yeah. got this uh, TV, Uptron was the name of the company. After I got this TV in my room, all the married officers and the children would gravitate to my room to watch the cricket matches and other important events on a colored screen. So <laughs> this is uh, again a very, very interesting picture, but more so for the bullet, as we call it. And today also I have a bullet, which is 1989 model, and I maintained it uh, beautifully. 
actually i saw an interview of yours uh, which was about you being a biker that is when i came across this picture and i was like i have to show sir and i have to know about this side of him you have so many hobbies <laughs> so it was really um, you know i cannot tell you how motivating you are to people because i i have been around on social media uh, busting propaganda for more than, more than a decade i have seen the change that people like you have brought about in the last 7 to 8 years uh, the kind you become an inspiring you know personality people look at you and they want to join the indian army so uh, it's, it's it's really an honor to talk to someone like you it's, it's, uh, it's really my honor to have you here and having interacted with you it's, it's uh, i'm overwhelmed with emotions right now thank you so much sir. thank you so much for your time thank you lavina and uh... i agree with you there is a lot of fake narratives there a lot of uh, fake propaganda coming not only from across the border but some people inside the nation also are contributing to that uh, fake propaganda because of their own biases because of their own uh, reasons together we will break that propaganda that's how i look at it as a nation as a country of such a big might of human resource of economic might of diplomatic might we will break this propaganda and i will be just one soldier in the whole thing you are only there thank you